So uh, like Sharon said, my name is Eric Conley. I'm the Gary County 4-H Youth Development Agent. And um, I <clears throat> have always been fascinated with uh, everything outdoors. Uh, Sharon and I have had a lot of chances to work together at State Fair doing tree stuff. And, uh, you know, I do a lot of environmental camping and do a lot of uh, personal camping and whatnot. And so the outdoors has always been a huge part of my life ever since I was a little kid. And so um, plants, uh, originally when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a herpetologist. So I wanted to study reptiles and amphibians. Um, uh, but uh, as I got older and I got my knees really started to hurt, I realized that snakes and salamanders and lizards and all those things really moved around a lot. And so I thought, what's the thing that I could focus on that's not going to move nearly as much? And it was plants. And so uh, so I've kind of settled into this where I just enjoy uh, plants. And like Sharon said, I'm a, a loosely a photographer and I get the chance to go out and uh, and do some photography stuff as well. And so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So we are gonna focus on the, um, actually the subfamily, the milkweed family. And so um, it, this is uh, the season of milkweeds. And I told Sharon uh, before we came on that I had a story. So yesterday there's a little spot down in Lincoln slash Pulaski County that I, there's a road that I like to drive on down there that just has an amazing amount of wildflowers in the spring hillsides covered in trillium uh, just a really just a beautiful spot and so I went down there yesterday and I thought I you know need a little bit of inspiration and I was driving on the road and you know like probably all of us do uh, if you're if you love plants at all you've probably done you know that uh, drive by botany where something just catches out of the corner of your eye the a color changes a a pattern changes or something like that. And the next thing you know, you've stopped and you take a look at it. Well, as I was coming back, there was a police officer that was on the side of the road and I passed by him. And then weirdly 50 yards down the road past him, I saw something out of the corner of my eye that I, that I recognized, but had not seen before. And so uh, I, I stopped, backed up, got out of my car and was looking at it. And it was, uh, uh, poke milkweed, um, Asclepias exaltata, and I'd never seen it before. And I thought, oh, well, that you know, that's new. Well, you know, I told you the police officer. I'd passed this police officer. Well, he uh, had stopped on the side of the road to examine a spot where he had just arrested somebody last week for um, drug use, and so then he saw me back up, stop my car, and so he pulled up behind me. And proceeded to question me about what exactly I was doing there, uh, because this road is uh, apparently a hotbed for drug use. Uh, but it was also a hotbed for um, uh, uh, milkweeds. And so we'll go through um, uh, the milkweeds. Uh, anyway, I did not get arrested. I just want to clarify. So, um, but uh, we'll go through this milkweed presentation. If you do have questions, please put those in the chat, and then we will uh, and and. If Kelly or Amy or whoever wants to stop me, uh, feel free to stop me and 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 hit me with any questions that you might have. So, so the the, the members of the family and, and when I say family, I'm really talking about the subfamily. So re recently, they changed the Asclepiadaceae family, which is the milkweed family, over and blended it in. Took the 348 members of that family and blended them into the. Aposinaceae family, which is the dog bane family. And uh, so dog bane was always recognized as kind of a, this, this part of milkweed, but we've, uh, botanists decided that, hey, we can't, uh, we can't just have things the way that they've always been. So let's go ahead and, and dump everything into one family. So the Asclepias, the milkweeds, are a member of that subfamily of Asclepiadaceae. Uh, there's 13 members of that family in Kentucky, and that's pretty common for the area that we're in, Tennessee, as you all know, uh, with uh, huge elevation changes uh, compared to Kentucky, uh, I think we're about 4,300 feet on Black Mountain, and I, they they well exceed that in um, in Tennessee. But Tennessee also only has 13 members of the milkweed family in in that state as well, uh, according to Nature Serve. And if you go on the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, or yes, OKNP. 
they do have a link to uh, what's called Nature Serve Explorer, and you can go on there and check the um, uh, local, you know, county all the way up to global um, populations of some of, well, of plants, of a variety of different things. So any any species that you can think of, any biological species you can think of. And so according to this, all the members of the milkweed family um, that we're looking at or, or of the subfamily are all globally secure. So all have um, really good populations that we don't need to worry about. Uh, they don't, we don't list any milkweeds as uh, anything with special or with a state listed designation. So no state endangered or threatened species of milkweeds in Kentucky. And then according to the Plant Life of Kentucky, which is a, a book by Dr. Ron Jones, and uh, and I'll, I'll put something at the end, but this is it, this gigantically thick book here, um, uh, lists uh, one out of the 13 is rare in Kentucky, five out of 13 is infrequent, and seven out of the 13 as frequent throughout Kentucky. Then, of course, you see the pictures there below, which um, the one on the left there is Asclepius quadrifolia, which is four-leaf milkweed. The one in the middle is uh, Asclepius viridis, which is green antelope horn milkweed. And then the one on the right there is swamp milkweed, uh, Asclepius incarnata. So uh, the other members of that subfamily that were originally the um, uh, Asclepius family was is Amphilamus, and there's only one member of that family that's found in Kentucky. Um, and so that's sand vine. These are all the common names for it that I was able to find, uh, sand vine, honey vine, or blue vine. So those are all the same thing. So you could be talking about the same thing. That's why, as I tell kids all the time, and I, I tell a lot of adults, scientific names can be very important, uh, especially when you're trying to limit the confusion of uh, what exactly it is that you're looking at. Uh, they're usually found in mesic to wet woods, and because there's only one of them, I thought I would give you a little bit more information about where exactly you can find them. Um, uh, and that's according to Plant Life of Kentucky. They're globally secure, of course. Uh, it's a vine. There's some just general botanical information here um, that if you're really excited about, you know, corollas and coronas and uh, all of those kinds of things, lobes, and if you love all that terminology, then this is a this, that book is really great for you, and uh, this is a little bit of information. And then these are some of the pollinators that feed on this one. This one is also one that can host monarch butterflies, and so uh, it's not just members of that milkweed family uh, or the specific milkweed group, the Asclepius group, but Amphilamus is, um, uh, can also be a host for those as well. Uh, the other, the third member of that, uh, of the milkweed subfamily is Matalia, uh, which is milk vine. That's a picture of it at the, that's a picture of one of them, the Carolina milk vine. Uh, there's three members of Matalia in Kentucky. Um, according to the Nature Serve, all members are globally secure or apparently secure. Uh, which means that uh, there's not been enough research done on populations to determine, uh, but they would imagine based on habitat that those are uh, still in, uh, populations are still definitely secure. Uh, Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves does list one as state in danger, and that's Matalia Carolin carolinensis, or carolinensis uh, the Carolina milk vine, which is the one that you're looking at there. So if you do travel or you um, uh, you hike or or you have property or you live in or anything uh, in those counties in Kentucky, Clinton, Russell, Cumberland, and McCreary County. Uh, it's a very it's a, a possibility that you may be able to see it. But if you list if you live in another county, especially along the Tennessee border, uh, this is one that you would you would want to keep your eye out and see if uh, see if we you have additional populations that exist out there. I know that the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves and their staff of botanists over there, Terra Littlefield, they would be ecstatic if, if they knew that the, there was another population of those that existed out there. And uh, so and uh, at Plant Life of Kentucky, uh, this is the one of the three that's listed as endangered, and then two of the three 
are listed as infrequent as well. And this is, I, and I took this picture off the internet. I actually took it off of uh, the Western Carolina Bot Botanical Society or Botanical Group. And this is the picture. So it's not one that I've ever been able to photograph, but it's absolutely gorgeous. And so I'd love to, uh, a chance. So if you do know where it's at, I'd love to, to get out and take a picture of it. So. So this is the beginning of the milkweed season and uh, milkweeds, depending on the species, can be toxic. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that's one of, this is where <clears throat> we start to get a lot of phone calls in the extension office or at, at least it, as I'm out and I'm wandering around and people start asking me, you know, what can I do about milkweeds? So this is where uh, that the confrontation between the preservationist or the conservationist and then uh, those with farmland sometimes uh, they can uh, that's where this there could be some some conflict uh, butterflies and other insects have developed a taste for milkweed and that protects them in basically all stages of their uh, of their life from egg all the way up until they are emerging adults Um, so these are the, the milkweeds that we have in the state of Kentucky. Um, the, um, with uh, scientific names and common names that are listed there, some of those have a variety of, of common milk or common names, uh, like the pokeweed, milk, poke milkweed or tall milkweed. Um, the one that I saw yesterday with the police officer. Uh, so I, I recognize it as poke milkweed, but also called tall milkweed as well. So um, what makes them interesting to use? Uh, so, or it interesting and or useful. And uh, so these are just, one of the things that I tell people when I talk about uh, plants is, you know, as a, as a naturalist, I guess I would say, and, and somebody that works with kids, I cannot take kids out there and say, oh, this is this is uh, common milkweed, uh, Asclepius syriaca. They will they do not care about that one bit. Uh, but if I can tell them some some interesting or useful things about plants, uh, especially very specific plants, then they they can become more a little bit more drawn into that. So these are some things that if you are ever interested in milkweed, um, these are just a few things that, to learn about it. So uh, milkweed seeds were used as waste cleanup for Native American papoose carriers. And so uh, they would tuck those into uh, those carriers. And uh, as accidents happened with babies, which we all know that they do, uh, they would, um, that's what they would use to clean that stuff up with. Uh, tall milkweed, which is the one that I saw yesterday, exudes a very sweet sugar from the flowers. And we'll talk about some of the edible properties of milkweed as well, which I know everybody is, uh, you know, we're, we're getting into that. Uh, we're starting to revert back to doing a lot of foraging and those kinds of things. So we'll talk about some of the edible properties and medicinal properties as well. But um, that tall milkweed, the flowers do exude an extremely sweet sugar. And that's why they're very popular with uh, a lot of insect species. Uh, swamp mil milkweed, uh, if you are a prepper or a survivalist, or you uh, just have a general interest in uh, outdoor being, um, uh, being safe in the outdoors and, and, and understanding where some... Uh, non-traditional materials may come from. Swamp milkweed is one of those that you can use. Uh, you can break down the stems of it and use it for fishing line or sewing thread uh, and, and other common materials, basically as a, as a, uh, a very light cordage, if you're interested in doing that. And then I'm sure that as you braid that out, uh, you can increase the strength uh, of those as well. Uh, milkweed seeds were used for fillers for wild, uh, World War II, life jackets, and a few pounds of silky seeds could keep float uh, a 150, 150 pound fighter pilot and keep that person warm as well. Uh, as far as the warmth, it was said that um, that it could that was warmer than wool in some cases. So uh, if you if you find yourself in a situation where 
you're cold or whatnot, you can start to fill a shirt or fill a jacket with uh, milkweed seeds, those, those silky seeds, and uh, they're supposed to keep you warm. Goldfinches use silky seeds to line their nests. So some of the medicinal things uh, you see there, um, milkweed has been used traditionally by Native American populations uh, historically uh, and to treat asthma, dysentery, remove warts, and for the people of Quebec, I would not imagine now in Quebec, but uh, they were also used as a contraceptive. So uh, these are all historical medicinal uses. I would not ever encourage that somebody just uh, read a list like this and think, oh, uh, I saw one time a 4-H agent was talking that milkweed can help me with my asthma. Let me, you know, lick some milkweed plants. That would be generally just a bad idea, but these are all historical medicinal uses of milkweed. And then as a food source, uh, the young flower buds, they can be used as a broccoli replacement, young sprouts. And the young sprouts is generally the uh, Asclepias syriaca, which is the common milkweed, can be eaten like asparagus and uh, immature pods. Uh, the, the pods, especially later in the season, the ones that are, are very small and tender, um, after you remove the silk, they can be used in a variety of soups and casseroles or served as a vegetable. Um, so, uh, what makes them a toxic or a nuisance? The cardiac glycosides that are found in them. So, uh, what uh, so what that does is those cardiac glycosides. It allows for uh, the it actually stops the exchange of ions in cells. And so, in some insect in some insects, you know, monarchs being one of those insects, uh, it's they have developed actually these three amino acids uh, in the in proteins found in monarchs that allow them to be able to absorb those cardiac glycosides. And so there's no disruption of those molecular pumps. And so it al allows things to move freely through. There was some research that was done on fruit flies where they actually introduced those same amino acids into some fruit flies. And uh, they were able to those fruit flies were then able to consume uh, milkweed as well. And they held on to the properties of milkweed. So as you all are well aware of, and I, I don't know how much time we ever want to spend uh, talking about monarchs. I mean, I love monarch butterflies, um, but uh, we, we sometimes talk a little bit, uh, we talk a lot about monarch butterflies. And so but one of the things about monarch butterflies is they, um, they of course, hold on to the toxicity of milkweeds. And so then as birds or other animals eat them, um, they, you know, they get that bitter taste, that bitter um, milkweed taste in their mouth. And so it makes them not so desirable to eat. Uh, so that, you know, that's where we come in with like viceroy butterflies and, of course, anything that mimics the, the coloration of monarchs. So... And, uh, you know, if you're uh, evolutionally speaking, you know, as uh, they have developed, as those um, animals have developed a taste against or a taste, not a taste for monarchs, uh, it's, it's um, you know, they, they start to see those colors or those patterns and they understand that that's not a good thing to eat. The protein softening compounds, if you've ever held on to milkweed before and you've ever gotten it on your fingers, the more of it you get on there, generally your fingertips will actually hurt. Um, if you get that milkweed sap on your hands. And so the um, the logical pro progression is, is that if you eat that milk, that milkweed sap, that uh, that it would soften some of those uh, those areas in your body that might be directly affected by uh, digestion. So places like your um, uh, your intestines and things like that can be negatively affected by consuming some of those uh, that or consuming milkweed sap. And then uh, and then of oh, and then the um, and then of course like uh, monarch butterflies have become. Uh, and I said that we talk a little bit too much about them, but you know the 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 original 
the original issue was the uh, human influence on the migration patterns of monarchs from uh, the United States down to areas in Central and uh, the Central America, Mexico. And so <clears throat> there was always this conflict between um, whether we protect monarch butterflies and protect milkweeds or eliminate them from fields uh, to reduce issues related to crop space and livestock and livestock. Uh, so it's gotten to the point though where um, and and you know I'd love to hear from, uh, some of the other people on the presentation about uh, how farmers in their areas have have handled uh, having milkweed, whether they are still the mindset, let's get rid of milkweed, or do they mark off areas, or do they, um, or have they just given, given over to areas in their fields to be used for milkweed, or whatever it might be. Um, but we still have a lot of people here in Central Kentucky and Garrett County that um, are looking to get rid of uh, get rid of milkweed so that you know they they don't have to save that space for milkweeds, uh, which of course causes problems with monarchs and other butterflies and other insects that use those plants uh, for um, uh, you know for hosts. So these are the resources that I used for uh, the presentation. Uh, the Sam Thayer's guide, the field guide to edible wild plants, that literally just came out like maybe a week ago, and it's a fantastic book. But I'm going to go ahead and pull one. So this is this is what the book looks like. This is, and it's it is a it is a sturdy sturdy book. Uh, so if you're a person that likes to carry something out in the field with you, this may not be the one that you would want to take out in the field with you. It's got, got a lot of density to it. Uh, the one in the middle, the plant life of Kentucky, we've already talked about that one. You can see how generally bulky that particular one is. And then uh, the last one is the wildflowers of Tennessee, the Ohio Valley, and the Southern Appalachians. This is an absolutely fantastic book. And it's not, it's got a little bit of heaviness to it, a little bit of density to it. But this is a really great book because not only does it talk about the, the general botanical um, descriptions of the plants, but also gives you a lot of historical medicinal um, food. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of great information that's in here. Tavia Cathcart, who is one of the authors, um, uh, she I think is the one that did the research on all of the historical and medicin medicinal and food uses, and really did a great job. So this is a great book if you're looking to carry something in the field. So. Um, and then uh, I didn't list this one on there because I did not use this one, but this is Wildflowers and Ferns of Kentucky. And this one has some general information if you're interested in specifics about Kentucky.